and start. All right. So glad y'all made it out. Wednesday evening service. Get away from the busyness of the week. And you say, well, you just made my week busier. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? We get to come and get away from it. In the word, in the hymns, together with Christians, you are in a safe Christian place when you're in your church. Amen. All right. And so I came up. Actually, I got the idea for tonight's message from my text from Sunday morning, which, by the way, we had our record visitor Sunday of the year. We had 14 visitors in one Sunday. It was amazing. It was a blessing, which made up for all the missing folks. We had about three, four families, three and a half traveling. And so it just, you know, I was a little like, oh, I'm going to have a quiet Sunday. It's going to be quiet. And it wasn't, it wasn't, and it wasn't. And, you know, it would have been okay if it was, right? But God just did something fun. It was, it was a blessing. It was a blessing. And so, but I came up with this idea for tonight from our text. So turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're not going to spend much time there. But I do want to read it. Sometimes the text, is, the concept from the text is the message but here Paul writes this in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. He says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those which have already died, Christians that have already passed away, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now obviously, when we lose a loved one in Christ... You know, we're sad at the loss of them. But it's, it, the idea here is not the kind of sorrow that the world who has no hope has. It's a different kind of sorrow. We're going to miss them now that they're gone. But we also know that they're with the Lord, which is good. And so it says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, those who have already died, Will God bring with him? For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord, wherefore comfort one another with these words. The message, the title of the message tonight is, Don't be ignorant. It's fun, right? Don't be ignorant. And that's how he starts this section, right? He says, I would not have you to be ignorant. The idea here is ignorance and stupidity aren't the same thing. He's not calling them stupid. He's saying there's something you don't know thoroughly yet. And I want you to know it. I want you to understand it. That's what the idea of ignorance is. There are a lot of people in this world, they, uh, what do we say, ignorant bliss? Ignorance is bliss, right? Don't tell me about judgment. Don't tell me about God. I'll just live my life. And, and actually, I think, it, is it Romans that says that they are willfully ignorant? In other words, they make up their mind that I am not going to pursue the knowledge of God, hoping that that will somehow excuse them, but it won't. It won't. Now, for the church, for the Christian, there are things that we should want to know, right? We should want to learn the Bible. We should want to learn God's will. But then, from the other side of the coin, from Paul's perspective, when I study through the scriptures, I find four things that he says, I don't want you to be ignorant about this. And one of those things is that Jesus is coming again. Amen. And it is a comforting hope that Jesus is coming again if you've trusted him as your personal Lord and Savior. If you haven't, it shouldn't comfort you. It should scare you. Because you're going to face the, judge, the judging Jesus. We had the sacrificial Jesus. We had the dying Jesus. We've had him already. He's coming back as the judging Jesus. And you're going to face him with all your sin if you haven't repented and trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that should make you afraid. But for the Christians, he says, listen, you haven't missed anything. That's what's next. 
What's next on your calendar is Jesus is coming again. Take comfort in that. I want you to know that. I want you to apply that. Turn with me to Romans 11. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I am going to read quite a bit because it's really hard to jump into this chapter in the middle because Paul is talking to the church about the difference between the the Jew and the Gentile, but specifically the Old Testament law versus New Testament grace, the nation of Israel versus the New Testament church. And I don't want to read the whole chapter. But he does start to quote scriptures about David in verse 9. Talks about how that they will fall into a trap and a stumbling block. In verse 10, how that their eyes will be darkened. And we're talking about Israel, it says in verse 7. Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. And so let's get to verse 11. We're talking about Israel. Paul says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. The Jews had the oracles of God. They had the prophets. They saw the miracles. They crossed the Red Sea. They were delivered time and time again from their enemies. They had the promise that their Messiah was coming. They rejected Jesus Christ. Because they stumbled at Jesus, the rest of the world got to get in on the blessing of the truth that Jesus is Lord and get into the church. But that's not a complete fall for the nation. That's a parenthesis in God's timetable. Now, it also says to provoke them to jealousy, to let them know there's something they're missing. The people that were not, were not a people are now God's church. Now, look at this. If the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you, Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostles of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. He says, I want them to see your faith, your repentance, your trust, and I want them to be like you and me and come to Christ. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruits be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, faithless Jews, we know the root is Christ. And thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them. Have you ever seen grafted trees before? I know a fellow, he used to love to graft in all different kinds of apple and pear trees in the apple and pear trees that he had. It's so cool. Now, if it's new, well, you can tell right away there's something going on. You You've got a piece that you cut off and you put the branch in and you, you tie it in, but it's going to grow in. But it wasn't there originally. And you can tell by the fruit that it, it's like something different is going on here. So he's saying basically Gentiles were grafted in to the plan of God. Some of the branches, the faithless Jews were broken off and we were grafted in. But it says this, verse 18, boast not against the branches but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. And then this sort of proud look at you know, this kind of, it's all about me sort of outlook that the church can have sometimes if they're not careful. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. It wasn't because of you. It was because of their failings that God made them an example and thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spare not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, but towards thee, goodness, 
If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And, and I'll stop there. But God's purpose in allowing blindness in part to come to Israel is so that the fullness of the Gentiles can come in. In part has the idea of temporary. Israel's blindness, Israel's lack of faith was temporary. Those branches were broken off. We were grafted in church age. It says their branches will be grafted in again. Okay. And so that's why when you say it sounds like too complicated, you start to talk about Daniel's 70th week. We reached Daniel's 69th week. They rejected the Messiah. And now we have the church age, and Daniel's 70th week won't happen until the church age is completed. Well, actually, Romans 11 here is a great coupling for that. Because you can see the prophecies of Israel stopped at a point. The branches were broke off. We were grafted in. They'll be grafted back in again. And so we can see all this prophecy coming to fruition here and, and, and taught by Paul in Romans 11. But one day... The Jews will realize their blindness and their folly and they will accept Jesus as the Christ and the glorious national restoration of these people will bring in the kingdom age. And so we are not to, in pride, you know, talk down about the nation of Israel. It's weird how in the church ages we've seen sort of this anti-Semitic movement at times. No, sir. I mean, the Psalms talk about, uh, you know, praying for the peace of Israel. I mean, we should, I understand that at this point in time right now as a nation, they've largely rejected Christ. But we've got to look at this history and we've got to look at the future. And we still, we still should honor that nation as, as God's nation. There's more to come. They're not through. And Paul said to the Romans, I don't want you to be ignorant about this. I want you to understand the full flow of the time period here and what's happening. We don't get to steal the Jews' promises. We don't, get to, we don't try to apply the Mosaic law. We've got something different going on as grafted branches, but the same root. Amen. It says all Israel will be saved. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So we're not ignorant about the coming in again of Jesus Christ. We're not ignorant about the mystery of the Jew and the, and the church. Having some different prophecies and different timelines going on there. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you be ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried, carried away unto these dumb idols. Think of the paganism they were in. Even as you were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. And that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. 
But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, now we're talking about the church, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. So here right away he says, I do not want you to be ignorant concerning the spirit, the spiritual things, the spiritual gifts. Notice, if you will, in your King James Gifts is italicized. We needed to add that because of English. Um, it's, it's a proper English edition, right? Context and language demands it. But the idea here is the, all, that, all the spiritual stuff, the spiritual gifts. The, and it's not just gifts. We've got the administrations, diversities of operations, etc., etc. All of the, It's not just gifts that he's talking about here. It's all these different workings of the spirit. Now... He says that maybe your past, not maybe, definitely your past teachings and experiences have built a poor understanding of the Holy Spirit and his gifts in your life. You don't just naturally understand from your culture the way God works. He says, you know that you were led away. You know you're all a bunch of pagans and you don't really understand. You were superstitious. You're idolaters. You don't really. You didn't really grow up in a culture understanding how the spirit works. So I don't want you to be ignorant about how the spirit works. And it's easy for us to take uh, the biases that we have from our culture and try to interpret the word of God and God's working through our biases. But here he says you've got to remove the biases and you've got to look at the things the way God lays them out. And so. Paul lays down a broad principle, says no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse. So this broad principle for discerning matters regarding spiritual gifts is that is to judge things by how they relate to Jesus Christ and who he is and who he isn't. And so does this supposed spiritual gift and spiritual administration glorify Jesus Christ? Or draw attention to an individual? Well, I think in the modern church, we know the answer to that. Does it promote the true gospel or a false one? The true Jesus or a false Jesus? Just because someone uses the name Jesus doesn't mean they worship the true Jesus. We have a great way of our culture of redefining terms. And people have redefined God, redefined Jesus to one of their own image, one of their own liking, one of their own preference. Jesus made it simple. He said in John 15, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will testify of me, will not speak of himself. The Holy Spirit doesn't draw attention to the spirit. He magnifies Jesus Christ. He says that in John 15 and in John 16. So the ministry of the Holy Spirit is not to promote himself, or any other man or any other ministry, but to glorify and represent Christ. So Paul goes on here to list some nine spiritual gifts in the following verses. And by the way, he lifts more than that in other places. But he calls it the manifestation of the Spirit is given. Now I want you to understand the difference between the presence of the Holy Spirit and the manifestation of The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is always present in you after you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Okay? The Holy Spirit is always present among believers. John 14, 6, Jesus said, The Holy Spirit will abide with you forever. However, at times the Spirit's presence is more apparent than at other times. He's present, but sometimes... He is more manifest. He chooses to manifest himself. Now, we should not think that the Holy Spirit is more present with us just because he's manifesting these gifts. The Holy Spirit is always present, but at times he's more apparent. And so it says, given to each one for the profit of all. The manifestation of the Spirit glorifies Christ and works to profit the entire church family, not just a particular individual. And so notice he starts with manifestations of the Spirit, and these seem rather benign. 
but they are the working and manifestation of the Spirit. If we look in verse 8, we have the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom. We have the, uh, the word of knowledge. Those two are in verse 8. In verse 9, we have faith. Okay? So the first three are manifestations of the Spirit that we see in our churches alive and well today. Those are manifestations of the Spirit. The thing is, is everyone wants the other stuff. Everyone wants tongues speaking and miracles and healing. Now, why does Paul even mention them? Because Paul was an apostle with the apostolic sign gifts there at the time in the day, using them in the church for the benefit of the church as the gospel spread into the world. A lot of these gifts were present at the writing of 1 Corinthians and have since passed away for now with the completion of the New Testament canon. Um, and so just because we see them listed here doesn't mean we expect them present in all people, in all generations, in all churches, at all times. A lot of these manifestations were for very specific times and places in history. The signs of the apostle were there during the apostles. Paul said, I'm the last of the apostles. There are no more apostles right now. Okay. And so with, with that have passed some of the apostolic sign gifts, but we still have these other manifestations of the spirit. So it is not correct to assume that all of these will be manifest in every generation. So don't be ignorant about spiritual gifts you know, we jump past the first three, but right now those are the most three evident and important in the modern church. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, faith. These are all manifestations of the spirit that we can look for in our own lives and in our own churches. And so there's one more. Have I given three? Yeah, we did coming of Christ, God's plan for Israel, spiritual gifts, and one more is right over in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 3 through 8, Paul writes, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So part of what you're supposed to be is a comforter for others. And that's why you go through stuff. Because you learn how to accept. You learn how to trust. You learn patience. You learn that God saves. God provides. And then you can bring that comfort to other people. And by the way, comfort is another word for the Holy Spirit, the comforter. And so we can manifest the Spirit in our life by comforting others in our trials. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. As He allows people to suffer more and more, they get more and more grace from Him. Inversely proportional. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffered. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Notice salvation keeps popping up here in the context of enduring suffering. In other words, well, you can be, you can be saved from tribulations, right? The sort of physical taking out of problems. But I also think that when people see Christians suffer and receive the consolation of God that they want what we've got. And when they see that, they say, what happened to you? How can you deal with that? How can you go through that? And we give them the gospel and they get saved. Amen. Verse 7, And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye also be of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant... Of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life, but we had descendants of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. 
All right, so we could go on, but we're going to stop there because tonight is meant to be an abbreviated message and I'm already getting on longer than I usually do. But the fourth, I would not have you be ignorant, is that suffering is part of the Christian walk. Paul said, I want you to know that we suffered. We, we've been beaten. We've been thrown in jail. We've been treated very poorly by our countrymen, by our society, by our government. And I want you to know that because I also want you to know we're okay. We're all right. Like we're smiling and we're still keeping on with our ministry because Jesus came into our hearts and helped us every step of the way. And so we're not just ignorant about suffering, but I don't want you to be ignorant about the consolation. Those words keep showing up in tandem uh, to console someone. You know, you got that crying kid and you bring him in and you give him that hug and you wipe away their tears and you're consoling your child. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to allow us to suffer. He wants to offer through the power of his spirit and the power of his relationship consolation. And then he wants to use that as a tool of salvation and witnessing for the lost world we're in. Folks, don't be ignorant. We're, part, we're partly called for some suffering and for some tribulation. And we ask all the times to be saved from even going through anything. That's not the correct request. The correct request is, help me to go through this with the consolation of the Spirit that I saw in Paul and in your believers throughout history so that I can be a blessing to others. Amen? Amen. That's all we've got tonight. Take some time in prayer. We'll see you Sunday morning at 1030.